Welcome back to Madman Review. So if you didn't know, the U.S. Army has formally announced their adoption of the XM-7 primary combat rifle and the XM-250 machine gun, both chambered in 6.8 by 51 mm These will replace their long-standing M4 and M249 in 5.56. This expensive move is expected to cost a whopping $4.5 billion over the forthcoming 10 years. In this video, we'll scrutinize the performance of the new U.S. Army rifle. Was it a step in the right direction or a failure of epic proportions when they decided to switch to this brand new platform? By the time October 2023 rolls around, the U.S. Army will possess over 16,000 XM7 combat rifles and in excess of 1,700 XM250 belt-driven machine guns. These will be distributed to the close combat troops. Upon receipt of the soldiers, these weapons will be renamed as M5 and M250, eliminating the X from their nomenclature. This indicates the termination of the preliminary testing phase, marking readiness for comprehensive production. The plan is to equip 120,000 soldiers with these brand new weapons. This number includes all infantry, cavalry scouts, combat engineers, medics, and forward observers. It's crucial to remember that only roughly 25% of the soldiers occupy active combat roles. Therefore, the remainder, such as the logistics and supply personnel, will probably continue to utilize the M4 for the foreseeable time ahead. The initial purchase will burden the taxpayers with approximately $20.4 million. A further $20 million has been allocated to initiate the manufacturing of the groundbreaking new 6.8 by 51 mil steel hybrid brass ammunition at the Lake City plant in Utah. This facility generates roughly 2 billion rounds of ammunition annually, constituting the lion's share of the U.S. military's small arms ammunition. What is the XM7? The XM7, earlier referred to as the XM5, is the U.S. Army's full-powered version of the SIG MCX Spear. However, the SIG MCX Spear, available to the general public, only comes in 308 Winchester and 65 Creedmoor. While the XM7 utilizes the brand new 68 by 51 mm also known as the 277 Fury. The 277 Fury employs a hybrid three-piece cartridge case with a steel case head and a brass body. Joined by an aluminum locking washer to withstand its high chamber pressure of 80,000 psi, it's superior to the 6.5 Creedmoor, demonstrating 6 to 9 feet less bullet drop at 1,000 yards while delivering 20 to 25 percent more energy. The reduced power 227 Fury ammunition does not use the stainless steel case head and therefore cannot reach pressure beyond current SAAMI brass specifications. It is nearly identical to the widely accessible 7mm 08 Remington in terms of muzzle velocity and downrange energy. But going back to the XM7, it's notably heavier than the current standard issue M4A1 of the US military. The XM7 weighs 8.38 pounds when unsuppressed, whereas the M4A1 only weighs 6.34 pounds when unsuppressed. It employs an SR25 pattern magazine and combinating 20 rounds in a box magazine, with optional 25 round magazines being available. The suggested combat ammunition load per soldier will be a total of 140 rounds spread over 7 20 round mags collectively weighing 9.8 pounds. This, in comparison, is less advantageous than the M4A1's basic combat load of 210 rounds across seven 30-round magazines, which collectively weigh 7.4 pounds. This implies that an operator equipped with the XM7 will be lugging a considerably heavier load with a slightly less agile rifle and with 70 fewer rounds. Makes no sense, does it? What's the point? It may seem like the armies are regressing to an older obsolete platform like the M14 with the XM7. However, pundits believe there are three pivotal technologies that have significantly transformed warfare since the 1950s, compelling this current change. Firstly, the advent of affordable scopes. 
Secondly, the development of ballistics body armor. And thirdly, innovative methods in firearms and ammunition manufacturing. These are the factors that, in my view, necessitate this idea today and would have made it virtually impossible to implement even a decade ago. This change is necessary because the U.S. military is concerned about potential engagements with formidable global superpowers such as China and Russia. This is the most monumental shift in the U.S. military in more than 50 years. Changes of this magnitude in the military are always fraught with risk, and there's a chance that this might end up being a colossal blunder. At the very least, there will undoubtedly be hurdles to surmount in revamping the military's training methodologies and combat doctrine. Just so we have the idea of its magnitude, consider that virtually all major militaries worldwide, including Russia and China, currently use weaponry and ammunition comparable to the smaller M4 and 5.56. The XM7 is much larger in comparison to Russia's AK-12 and China's QBZ-191. By the same token, the XM7's ammo is also much larger compared to Russia and China's. That equates to a significant increase in firepower. Interestingly, it was the U.S. military that initially sparked the trend of transitioning from a large caliber to a smaller one back in the 1960s. The Good The introduction of the new caliber would be utterly pointless without this scope. To help you visualize it, consider this scenario. If a U.S. soldier encounters a Russian armed with an AK-12 or a Chinese soldier equipped with a QBZ-191, which we talked about in one of our videos, the U.S. soldier would now enjoy an extra range of 300 meters. But doesn't it require an exceptionally skilled marksman with thousands of hours of training to accurately hit targets at that distance? Nope. If they have a good optic. Since the 1950s, there has been a significant advancement in firearms scope technology. Only recently, within the past decade, has optic manufacturing matured to a point where it's financially feasible to mass-produce large quantities of 8 by magnified scopes for each rifle. An extra $2.7 billion will be invested over the next decade on the innovative computer-driven 1 to 8 by XM157 Vortex fire control system. This expenditure permits the manufacture of up to 250,000 of these optics, enough to equip every single combat role within the military. So how do these optics work? When the operator activates a button, it registers sensor data from the laser rangefinder, humidity, temperature, and elevation. All this information is processed by a ballistic computer chip, which then automatically adjusts the red dot. However, this technological marvel doesn't come without a cost. The standard infantry rifle will probably add an extra 5 pounds to the total weight. Another relatively recent military innovation since the 1950s is the mass production of ballistic body armor. It wasn't until the early 2000s that these were deployed in large numbers within the U.S. military. China and Russia took note and have now outfitted their own soldiers with ballistic plates. Such ballistic plates were not even in existence when the M4 was designed. The 277 Fury, with its superior ballistic performance, should be able to pierce through these without much effort. Oh, and one last thing. In the 1950s, the battle rifle had to be extraordinarily long and awkward with a 20-inch barrel to ensure that bullets had sufficient muzzle velocity for accuracy beyond 600 meters. This made the weapons unwieldy and ill-suited for door-to-door combat, leading to the transition away from them. So what's changed then, making the XM7 a viable weapon today? Present-day battle rifles can have a shorter barrel between 13 and 16 inches without compromising on muzzle velocity or barrel life. This is largely due to the new high-pressure ammunition, which fires at around 80,000 PSI. The bad... Some analysts opine that this weapon is not aptly suited for dense jungles like those in Vietnam or the urban warfare scenarios in Iraq. The main contention against the NGSW is that it's excessive, with the army having swung from one extreme to equipping troops with the underpowered M4 to now arming them with this overpowering XM7. 
The suggested alternative here would be to strike a balance between the two rifles. Some would still carry an M4, others would carry an XM7. But there are reportedly issues arising from civilian testing, as it turns out the XM57 fails after a single round in a mud test. Given that the platform operates on a piston-driven system, it lacks the gas that the original M16 design utilized to expel debris from the ejection port. Perhaps aiming to avoid long-term health and safety concerns linked to rifle gas, the Army has chosen an operating system that's less robust in battlefield conditions. While this decision can be understood from certain perspectives, in the broader context, it could potentially result in a detrimental cost-benefit analysis, risking severe consequences in war scenarios. Civilian testing, either not conducted or concealed by the Army, has also recently shown that the rifle seemingly fails to meet its base criteria of penetrating level 4 body armor at point-blank ranges. True, the Army never explicitly set this as a goal, but it is nonetheless implied at every level from media to Congress that the rifle will penetrate said armor unassisted. Indeed, that was the fundamental objective of the program. Of course, the rounds can penetrate body armor with armor-piercing rounds, but the same is true for 762 by 51 NATO, and even 556 by 45 NATO. Another issue pertains to the weapon's sight. The Vortex XM157, which may have crucial components manufactured in China, is certainly not an auto-aiming sight. For assured hits, the shooter still needs to manually ping the target. This takes away valuable seconds and renders shooting with 100% accuracy on the fly as visualized under the program to justify the reduced available round count. An absolute fantasy. Apart from these features, the scope is essentially a regular scope. The Ugly The biggest problem with the program is the insufficient supply of tungsten available from China, as the Army knows, making the aim of transforming every round into armor-piercing barely plausible. The plan also takes for granted that the world's largest supplier by far would have no objections to selling tungsten to America, only for it to potentially be used against its own troops in a hypothetical World War III scenario. Even the production of steel core penetrators would present significant challenges when the time comes, adding layers of complexity and time to an endeavor which is deeply time-sensitive. Regardless, most major bullet manufacturers, and even the Army, prior to the program, have shifted to tungsten penetrators for a reason. Despite it raising the cost by an order of magnitude and supply issues, maybe the Army has a solution. Maybe. The marginal improvement in ballistic coefficient between the 6.8x51 and 7.62x51 cartridges neither vindicates the financial investment into the program nor does the modest increase in kinetic energy delivered on target, which is a mere function of case pressurization within the modified 7.62mm case. Therefore, the overall mechanical outcome of the program design-wise is a rifle still chambered in 7.62x51 NATO base case, now featuring dual-weapon charge options and a folding stock. This marks the boundary as the highly touted generational design leap under the program. While the highly advanced case pressure technology is certainly a good thing, the issue lies in the fact that, in terms of ballistics, the round is not markedly superior compared to existing off-the-shelf options that the Army nearly selected under the now-denounced Interim Combat Service Rifle Program, or indeed those it somewhat paradoxically acquired just prior to the start of the NGSW program with the HK M110A1. Personally, I think the XM7 looks promising, but as with all things that are brand new, only time will tell.